This is The Sailing Podcast with David and Karina Anderson, episode number 68. We would love you to support us on Patreon. Visit www.patreon.com forward slash sailing. Hello again, it's David Anderson here and thank you for joining me for the 68th episode of The Sailing Podcast. Today's conversations with Richard Hudson. Now, he's uh, circumnavigated the Americas in his schooner, Isuma, and we hear about why Richard chose the Damien 2 design, and also about the perils of having to purchase a yacht sight unseen, because the yacht was for sale in France while Richard was in New York. Now, we only spoke about a fraction of Richard's sailing, and there really are some other interesting stories on his website, which is Asuma.com, including his account of being rolled over in his former yacht, Orbit 2, in a Force 9 storm 300 miles south of Iceland. Now, if you download the Sailing Podcast app from the iTunes or Google Play Store, you'll find not only the podcast, but a bonus PDF guide, which is written by Richard about sailing small schooners. Now, I do mention it during the interview, and Richard was kind enough to let me share it as a PDF bonus to this episode. So if you haven't got the app on your phone, just search for The Sailing Podcast in iTunes or Google Play, and Google Play is perfect if you've got an Android phone. Now, there's an interesting thread which has developed over the past three episodes. With uh, One was with Lewis of Alaska Adventure Sailing. Uh, there was Ross and Topher from Chasing Bubbles. And now Richard uh, Sailing Isuma. And all of them have taken huge trips, but using crew that they sourced along the way. It just goes to show there's plenty of opportunities to gain some valuable experience by looking on sites like findacrew.net, which is the one Richard used for finding crew for his travels. And don't forget, uh, way back in the time machine, I talked to Kylie from Find a Crew. That was all the way back in episode three. So I'll pop a link to that one in the show notes, along with uh, links to Richard's site, which is asuma.com, and I'll put all of that at thesailingpodcast.com forward slash 68. And now, here's the interview. Well, hi, Richard. Uh, Welcome to the Sailing Podcast. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you, David. I know. Thank you for sort of giving me some of your time. I, I was looking at a map of some of the adventures that you've had and uh, it looks just amazing to see all the places you go. When I start my interviews with people it's always nice to go back and hear a little bit of what their sailing history is and an interesting thing when I looked at your sailing history on your blog um, somewhere I saw a mention that it also goes back a couple of generations and you have a link to the Shackleton expedition. My uh, my great uncle, my father's uncle, was the navigator on Shackleton's Antarctic expedition. Yeah, that's that's my link to that. Th- that's amazing. What was his name? His name was Hubert Hudson, and he was a Royal Navy officer and who uh, unfortunately died in the Second World War. Um, and so I, I've never actually met him, but uh, yeah, he was the uh, now, a navigating officer on the endurance. Wow, HMS endurance. I, I, that's an amazing story, and uh, I know Shackleton's a, a, a favourite character of one of the other guests I've had on a couple of times, which is Matt Rutherford. Um, I enjoyed the Shackleton story. I, I saw recently they'd done like um, some of the a couple of Australians had gone and re sort of uh, redone the Shackleton, the sort of epic part of the journey. Did you catch that? It was a guy called Tim Jarvis had put together a reenactment. I missed that. I know there's been several attempts, but I, I missed that that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Were I'll, they successful in, in doing it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It was on Australian TV at some stage. But, uh, yeah, I'll have to find you a link to that, and I'll, I'll send it through to you. But you've also been, um, well, guys, like I was saying, I mean, you've got this history of, of, of people being on expeditions, but you've been to Antarctica yourself. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. I was in Antarctica in January, though with much nicer conditions. <laughs> wow, just January. Much less demanding conditions. <laughs> you, you were down in January so, this year? Yeah, January 2016, yeah. Oh wow, that that's amazing! Um, you must have a pretty um, 
interesting boat. I had a little look at it. I mean, you've got to have something sort of purpose built to be going down into into climates like that. Um, I looked it up. The boat is called Isuma, and actually, I'll just mention now. Also, your your website's Isuma dot com. Can you tell me a little bit about the the boat, and that might then let us lead into the the travels that you've had in Isuma. Am I saying it right? Uh, yeah, yeah, Isuma. Yep. The boat is a uh, Damien II design, which is a French design, uh, built originally for Jerome Ponce, and it was it was designed for Antarctica. It's 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 heavily built of steel, and all the ballast is in a lifting keel. The idea with that is that, for one, you can get into a shallow place to uh, avoid a storm, but also if the ice catches you, you can raise the the centerboard and there's there's less for the ice to grab you, so you're more likely to be popped up than crushed by the ice. And there are several, I, I think there were 25 of these boats built, I'm not entirely sure on that. They were built by Meta in France for owner completion. And I'm the third owner of this boat. The second owner finished her off and sailed her about 50,000 miles and then sold her to me. He took her back to France and sold her to me. And I had been looking for one of these for a few years. I'd, I, I was really interested in the design. I'd heard about this design. I was very interested in it. I thought it was just absolutely the right kind of boat for the high latitude stuff that I wanted to do. It, I had owned two steel cruising boats before this, so I, I was quite happy with the steel boat. And so finally I found one for sale on the internet and I was very concerned that if I didn't buy it, someone else would. And at the time my, I was living in New York, I was working there and my Canadian passport had expired and it was a bad year for the passport to expire because it ended up taking 10 months to get a renewal. So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, wow, you know, if I don't buy this boat, you know, it's the only one that's come on the market for three years. I'm just, I'm, I'm not going to be able to buy it. And it's, someone else will buy it. And, you know, you should, you should never buy a boat without actually looking at it. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but <laughs> on the biggest boat I've ever bought, I ultimately did buy it without ever actually looking at it. Because I was concerned that I wouldn't be able to buy it. And I thought it was the right design. So I, I hired a, a surveyor from the UK to go over. To, it was in the north of France. And he was in the south of the UK. And I heard him to go over and do a survey and take a lot of pictures and email me pictures. I was very concerned that I might buy a bunch of pictures on the internet without actually buying a boat because you know, I wanted to make sure that some unrelated party had actually seen this boat and it actually yeah. was a real boat, not just pictures. And so, yeah, I uh, did all this remotely and bought the boat without actually seeing it. And two weeks after I bought the boat, my passport came through and I was able to actually fly over and see it. But at that point, it was winter. I did fly over and see it. And I, I didn't quite, I, I, I think I underestimated, underestimated the condition it was in. Um, but these things happen. Uh, I had, I had sa- before, I had sailed across the Atlantic in another boat. So I, I wasn't, it's, it, it's a lot to, to pick up a new boat someplace. And and plan to pick up, sorry, not a new boat, but a used boat, to just fly in someplace, pick up a used boat you know nothing about, and sail it across an ocean. That was my plan. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't have tried that if I hadn't already sailed across the Atlantic. So I at least felt comfortable with that, and I'd done two refits on boats before, so I, I felt comfortable in fixing stuff. But even so, it was the boat was in pretty bad condition, and... Uh, we ended up, my crew and I ended up fixing and sailing and fixing and sailing and fixing and sailing. And we went down the coast of Spain. Well, actually, actually, we, we did, my first attempt was from, from the north of France. We were going to go to the Azores. And three days out, a few things happened. One, the, <laughs> the, the protein pain tank and the spare protein tank, which I've been told one was full and one was almost full. And they, they weighed about the same. Um, Unfortunately, actually, one was empty and the other was almost empty. So we were out of propane. Oh, and we'd been confused about the way of filling the water tanks. And we'd, 
gotten confused by water coming out the vent hose and thinking that meant the tank was full, but actually it was water trapped in the vent hose. So we were running short of fresh water. And so for those reasons, we turned, turned around and, and went to Spain, went to Vigo, Spain, and worked on the boat for a week, got a whole new propane system because they use different bottles in, in Spain than they do in France. And we, we did the whole thing. Left, had some troubles with the furler, returned after a day, another week working on the boat. And on our third attempt to go to the Azores, the wind wasn't right, so we went to Madeira instead. You know, this is the kind of thing that happens when you're sailing, especially when you have a, a boat that needs a lot of work. We fixed and sailed and fixed and sailed, went down to the Canaries, went down to Cape Verde, then went to Argentina and did the first reset there. Um, then went up to Bra- I went up to Brazil. I was... I was heading farther north. I was trying to do the Northwest Passage then, but I got dengue fever in the north of Brazil. And by the time I got over that, got my strength back from that, that that took quite a while. It's uh, a tough thing to get. But it was too late to go north. And so I went back to Argentina again, did more work on the boat, got her in better shape. And then the next year, single-handed from Buenos Aires up to Brazil and then to New York and New York picked up a crew and we sailed north and went up the coast, went to Greenland, we had some problems in the Labrador Sea and I wasn't able to make the Northwest Passage that year. We went up to Baffin Island instead, which is northeast Canada. It's, it's, it's west of Greenland. And then went back down to New York. I, I had a, my, my problems were with the rigging wires and I bought some new rigging wires and visit, went to Toronto. I was born in Toronto, Canada. Yeah. And my parents lived there and I wanted to visit them. So we went up there for the winter. And then the next year we left, went down the St. Lawrence River, out the Gulf of St. Lawrence, up the coast of Labrador, over to Greenland, up the coast of West Greenland, and then through the Northwest Passage across the north of Canada and around Alaska. And then wintered in Southeast Alaska and then went down to Vancouver the next year. And then I, I stopped sailing for a couple of years and, and worked. Mm-hmm. And then my second trip on this boat was from Vancouver down to California, then Mexico, then Easter Island, then Chile, down the coast, Patagonian coast of Chile to, Argent- to Ushuaia, Argentina, and then to Antarctica, South Georgia, South Africa, Namibia, and then St. Helena. And from St. Helena, I was single-handed to... North Virginia, and then came up the coast to New York, where I am right now. Wow, uh, that that's uh, it. Always sort of it, it sort of uh, blows my mind when people can summarize such an enormous amount of sailing. You know, in, in just a few minutes, Richard, I'm looking at the map, and I want to share this map with people because it just looks amazing to see the voyages that you did. Um, and and you know it's a it's a circumnavigation of the uh, American continent, and um, yeah, that that's just amazing. Thank you. And and I was, it was looking... something I've wanted to do for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I mean you were talking about. I'll go back to the start. You were talking about buying a boat, sight unseen, and obviously the, there's risks with that. But you at least came, I guess, from a background of of sailing, and perhaps that gave you gives you a bit of a bit of a head start on maybe a first time boat purchaser might be a lot riskier for them to be contemplating buying a, a, a boat unseen but it sounds like you pretty much had done your homework and you knew that you wanted this uh this damien schooner with the with the sort of ability to perform in the in the the high latitudes that you were planning to do i love the swinging keel there's there's so many great photos you've got on your site to share and I was looking at that swinging keel I'd never seen one on a boat like that before I mean I know the distant shores guys sail around with a swinging keel but I think their purpose is so that they can beach the boat on sand not sort of uh, fight against uh, potential ice things Um, I read on the side is this right it's four and a half tons of swinging keel the the lead in the swinging keel is four and a half tons. And then the, I'm not sure what the steel weighs. And it, it, it also acts as a, a fuel tank, a 650 liter fuel tank. Wow. So it, it probably weighs closer to five and a half to six tons in total, probably when it's full. 
And and how did how, what's the mechanism then to swing um, the the five and a half tons? Is it something you can do yourself? It's a, it's an electric winch going through pulleys that that lifts the keel or or swings it up. It's a, it's a center board. It's got a pin. It swings. It doesn't. It's not a dagger board that's driven straight up and down. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, it's an electric winch that swings it up, and I cannot do that by hand. Mm. And if the if something was to happen with with the electric winch and I could not raise it, then then I would have a, a sailboat with a deep draft. It's 3.2 meters, 10 and a half foot draft for sailing. Which the, I, I love the lifting keel in this boat. It's a fantastic thing because it it does let you get into shallow, relatively shallow places, but does keep the the weight low enough in the boat that you can actually that it's still a heavy boat like this still sails, but. Uh, you must have the thing down and locked. There's a one inch diameter pin that goes through it yeah. to lock it in place so that if it hits something it, or, or that if you roll over that the center board can't come up. And that's, that's absolutely critical to remember to do before you set sail, because otherwise if you caught a gust of wind and, and healed over a lot, and then if the center board was ever to come up without being locked in place, well then mm. you'd be dead. You'd be, the boat would roll over. You'd, it would not come back up. Everyone would die, and that's why all boats are not made this way. It's, yeah, it's it, it's a great feature, the lifting keeled with all the ballast in it. But I I, I totally understand why it, it's it, it it's something you have to always be a little uh, concerned about and 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 always aware of um, to to use safely. And Richard, I hadn't realized you'd done so much sailing um, solo. You know, Isuma is is a schooner. And I did read, you've got some information on your website about sailing a, a schooner and um, part of it sort of refers to the the, the advantages of uh, not having um, so big a sails uh, to sort of deal with. Was that part of the rationale when you were boat shopping? I mean, or, or I, actually, I think you've had a couple of them, haven't you? Schooners, you, you seem to love them for, for that reason or is there other things? When I started sailing, it was... Uh, in dipping lug schooner rigged converted lifeboats when I was a kid. And then I, I worked on a training ship, which is a brigantine, which is basically a schooner with a square sail and a foremast. And so I was quite familiar with schooners. I, I did own two of them before I bought the Um I really bought a Suma for the lifting keel. The, I, I thought that was, that was what I really wanted out mm-hmm. of it. And it happened to come with a schooner rig. Um, yeah, the advantage, of, as you say, of the schooner rig is, or of a multi-masted rig is that you break the sails up into smaller pieces. The disadvantage being that they're less efficient that way. But the ad- advantage is, is that it's it's less, each sail is smaller in size, so somewhat so easier to handle or not so easy to get out of control. Right. Um, and the solo sailing, is that something you like to do? Or has that sort of... Just, just come about sort of because some of the trips it sounded like when you were ta- telling the story. Then it was some of the longer legs you were sailing solo. Was that sort of just just a, a necessity with sort of trying to find crew, or, or was that something you've planned to do because you enjoy doing it? That was that started as a necessity, just just because of uh, can't find crew at a, at a particular time, and I I'd always preferred sailing with crew because I, I uh, sailing with good crew. Um, but sometimes depending on where you are, you can't, may not be able to find crew and volunteer crew at least. Sometimes it just happens. You can't find crew or you have crew, but they get sick or, or something like that. Or, you know, some, some situation comes up and they can't continue. And at that point, you know, you're, if, if you really need the crew, then you're stuck waiting for them, waiting to find some new crew. Yeah. Um, or else you're going to go single-handed. And so I always wanted to make sure my boat was capable of being single-handed. So I, I made sure to set things up that way. And yeah, then it's my, my single-handing on this boat tends to be when I can't find crew, I single-hand. I, I actually came to like it. I really enjoyed my last passage, which was my longest single-handed passage. Um, it was, uh, I'm thinking it's, somewhere around 5,500, 5,800 miles. Uh, and 
it was really a powerful personal experience to be alone at sea that long. I that I had not I had not expected I would like it that much. I wasn't looking forward to it. I, right, right. Uh, but uh, it, it just happened, and I, I really enjoyed it. That's interesting. I was looking at that. You know, we were talking about the start of your journey where you, you started with the boat in France and then you, you've sort of sailed. When I look at the map, it's almost like you've sailed diagonally down from, um, you know, all the way down to Argentina, which just seems like such an unusual path. I mean, I don't know why, but always when I look at people's paths, they tend to go straight across the the North Atlantic and end up in the Bahamas or something. Uh, what what made you sort of island hop through the the center of the Atlantic Ocean and end up in Argentina? Was there was there a connection there, or was that just something that you wanted to do? That was uh, not entirely planned. <laughs> okay, my original plan, <laughs> my original plan with the boat was I was trying to negotiate to get three months off work to sail my boat that I bought in France back to New York. And I was working for a bank in New York. And this was in 2008, just when all the banks failed. And ultimately, I couldn't get permission to go. And I had already like arranged, arranged crew, I'd arranged air, air tickets, I'd, I'd sent a whole bunch of stuff over uh, to France. And, and so I, I, I just quit my job and left and went to France. I was, I was still trying to get across like I I was trying to leave the 1st of May and, and to make it across the Atlantic before hurricane season got well underway. Yeah. Uh, as it turned out, my boat needed an awful lot of work and we were nowhere close to being able to make that crossing until the hurricane season was really well underway, at which point you don't want to try that. And, and there was no reason, at, at that point, it became apparent that I could see what was happening with the, all the banks filing, and there was no jobs to go back to, so there was no reason for me to hurry back. And <clears throat> I thought it would be better to go do a refit on the boat. And France is not France is a very expensive place to do a refit on a boat. Yeah. Um, I thought South Africa would be a great place to do a refit because I I thought it's big yachting center, lots of stuff, and they speak English and. So my plan was to go to South Africa. And so we went to get to South Africa, to get around the South Atlantic High, to get to South Africa from the north of Africa, like where Cape Verde is, you basically go down the, the east coast of South America or you go on, the, on the, the west side of the – you go down the west side of the South Atlantic Ocean until you get south of the high and then you go pretty much straight east across. So that was the plan. Um, Unfortunately, we had enough problems at sea with, with breakdowns that 800 miles southeast of Rio de Janeiro, I decided, thought that, you know, I, really South Africa is not where I should be going. We should go to Argentina instead. So I, I originally did not want to go to Argentina for the reset because I didn't speak Spanish. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I went to Argentina anyway and learned Spanish. Okay, and what was it like value-wise? I mean, I'm just guessing. I mean, Argentina, to me, wouldn't sound like a particularly expensive place, not if you were comparing it to maybe France or even Australia. Um, is that an, a correct assumption, or was it still expensive? Oh, no, the, the labor rates are, are quite low in Argentina. There are other challenges there. The, the, the culture is much different, but uh, yeah, it's it's a lot less expensive to do a refit in Argentina. I, I did a lot of work in Brazil as well. Uh, Ar Argentina and Brazil, it's, it, it, they're a lot less expensive places to get boat work done than than France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the end of the day, it was just sort of that. It would you just sort of got to that point, and it was better to to stop there and get the work done than than try and continue get back to South Africa. So we're talking about, that was about 2008 you picked up the boat. So perhaps it's uh, 2009 by the time you're in Argentina. And I'm just trying to give people an idea of, because I'm thinking about your Northwest, so your, your sail through the Northwest Passage was um, 2012, I think I wrote down somewhere. 2011. 2011. And... 
why how did that come to be on the the sort of top of the the to-do list for you because i mean you've you've gone to buy the boat with the intention of of high latitude sailing had you had you just where where does that desire come from that's i'm asking that because i'm sitting here in a sort of subtropical climate um i can see that the photos are beautiful when people sail through uh the northwest passage and and the photos that you take on a sunny day look fantastic but there's a there's a there is a bit of a downside to it yes there's a bit of a downside to the northwest passage <laughs> that's, that's correct it's uh it's a it's a hard way of of getting across as getting between the atlantic and the pacific uh you, you never know whether you can do it in one season or not it it entirely depends on the ice situation that year yeah. and you don't know what that's going to be until mid august or sometime in August, and, and August is your month when you're really trying to get through the the main part of that, because uh, come September, you're, you're, you're starting to get the autumn gales settle in, and you've got less hours of daylight, and when you're sailing around ice, if you don't have light to see, you know, you're going to have to slow down or stop. So, yeah, the Northwest Passage is a really difficult way of getting to the Atlantic Pacific. It has some, some beautiful scenery in places, and it's something I wanted to do for a long time. I lived in northern Canada for five years, and I I kayaked a few thousand miles through northern Canada and Alaska oh, wow. and traveled around quite a bit. Uh, and it was just always something I wanted to do, the Northwest Passage. And uh, that's, that's why the desire to do it. And it didn't seem like I was, there was a lot, it didn't. It didn't seem like it was a good time to go go back to work, and I thought it was a good time to go through the Northwest Passage. So that was why That's the Northwest excellent. Passage. I, I was also interested in getting. I, I was interested in getting to the West Coast. Also, I should say that was also my goal. I I thought it was a place I'd never really sailed much, and I wanted to go there. I heard lots about it. Right, and so going through the Northwest Passage, how many of you were on the the boat for for a journey like that? So I had two crew with me um, until Kodiak. So through the, the technical part of the Northwest Passage, I had two crew for the whole time. And then I was single-handed from Kodiak, to, across the Gulf of Alaska, from Kodiak to Yakutat. And then I had a, another friend come up and, and join me for the trip to through Southeast Alaska. And, and, and then most of the way to Vancouver, the, after the winter, I did that by myself. But the Northwest Passage itself, I had two crew. Ah, oh, excellent. And uh, that, so, so you're based there. You got to the boat to Vancouver. I mean, it just sounds like uh, it just feels like such an understatement to say so little about sailing through the Northwest Passage. I mean, it must have been just so exciting and 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 mixture of storms. And I guess you saw the polar bears and sort of had to plan all that technical sailing through the area. I mean, what what were the, some of the challenges? There's a, there's a lot of, this passage is a lot of, uh, you you decide to go, you get yourself far north, and you attempt it, and you find out at that point whether you're likely to get through that year or not. And then you got to decide if you're going to keep going or not. Uh, I lucked out. I, I happened to go through in a record low ice year, but that wasn't something I was expecting. And until, until you, you've pretty much got to go up to 74 and a half, 75 degrees north and get yourself in position to go through where the, the difficult ice sections are of the Northwest Passage, the, the, the parts that are the last to break up and that sometimes don't break up. Uh, you've, you've got to be up way up north in a position to go through by the time mid to late August comes around or else you will not be able to make it through. So you, you, you can't, you can't wait for a good ice year and then go, you have to go and find out if it's a good ice year or not. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you really plan, a, plan ahead, don't you? You've got to, you've got to commit even though you don't know if it's going to you, pay off. That's right. You, you've got to commit and, and you've got to be prepared. You know, you've got to have lots of food. If you, if you have a breakdown, if you slow down, if you get stuck by ice, I mean, the possibility of having to winter over is definitely always there. Um, hopefully you would be able to get to some community and, and winter the boat over there. 
but there, there are no good places to winter a boat in the North Coast Passage. There are places you can do it, but they're, they're, I, I don't think I'd call any of them really good, desirable places. You'd, you'd rather take your boat through and yeah. get it somewhere farther south. Yeah. So yeah. you're always concerned about that. Uh, to me, I always had lots of concerns about the Northwest Passage, but not wanting to get stuck and um, concerns about ice and things like that. It was uh, it was it was a, a fair amount of effort to get through it. There were some nice places to see, um, but you're also pressed for time because the longer you spend in the Northwest Passage, the later it is when you're getting out of it. And when you're getting out of the Northwest Passage, you're either going into the Bering Sea or you're going into the Labrador Sea. And you're doing it in the autumn when with all the autumn gales and less daylight. And, and both those places are really nasty, really nasty seas. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't really want to be in those places late in the year. Yeah. It, it's yeah. just a rough, they're just rough. Did, did you find yourself fairly isolated sailing or were there other boats around at the time, Richard? There were other boats that I was aware of through uh, email and in port you'd meet them. But so much of the time the, the visibility was poor from fog that you wouldn't really, I, I don't think I ever actually saw another boat in the Northwest Passage sailing. There were several at the same time, but I'd, I'd see them in port. Uh, well, several. There was a few, uh, but you'd only see. I'd only saw them in port. Never actually saw them sailing. Right. Well, let's talk about a little bit about the coming down the the west coast of the American continent. I can't just say the U.S. Um, you left the boat in Vancouver, and I guess you had to go and find a job for a little while. I I found a job in Vancouver, so I worked in Vancouver for a couple of years. Ah, right, excellent. And then you get sort of saved up got the boat um did you have to do any refitting while it was in vancouver or was it sort of more a, a maintenance time there was there was maintenance while i was in vancouver and then i actually spent six months after i quit my job i solely worked on my boat for six months Excellent. and then left vancouver in september 2014 um, on my second trip which was two years long and that that trip so, when, when you left there um New crew, or are you sailing by yourself now? I had I had crew. I had different crew at different times. I had uh, between one and three crew. I went to Washington State, California, Mexico, and then Easter Island in Chile. And in in, in Chile, in in near near Puerto Montt in Isla Chiloé, I spent the 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 southern hemisphere winter there, and then got a crew and. In the spring, went down the Patagonian coast to Ushuaia, Argentina. The Patagonia was absolutely awesome. I, I just love to go there. I mean, I love the stories that come out of that area, and yeah, it just looks it looks breathtaking. Um, yeah, I think I think it would be an amazing place. Yeah, it, it's 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 always rainy and windy. The charts are good in places, not in others, and it's it's complicated to to anchor there because you most of the time you have to use shorelines but some stunningly beautiful places and very remote uh, there, there's, there's quite a bit of bureaucracy you have to deal with with uh, reporting into the navy and getting permission on paper and to and so on and so forth but it's a it's a really beautiful place and uh just just uh, this untouched wilderness kind of place yeah, no, that would be amazing. Hey, can I go back one step, one or maybe two steps in the journey? I'm impressed you stopped at Easter Island, uh, probably not on the on the paths of of many travelers. What was the what was the rationale for going to Easter Island? I mean, it's a fascinating place. Everybody knows the the big statues, and my son's doing uh, he's studying environmental science at the moment, and they were just learning about how the uh, the Easter Islanders cut down all their trees and nearly uh, uh, sort of destroyed themselves by doing so? What what made you go there to visit? Uh, Easter Island, to, to get from, from Mexico to Patagonia, it's because of the, the, the southeast trade winds, 
if you were to go down the coast, you'd be beaten against the southeast trade winds and against the Humboldt Current up the west coast of South America. So if, if you really like sailing and not motoring, the way to go is to go way offshore, way out where Easter Island is, and try and get yourself around the South Pacific High and then go east to Patagonia. At that point, Easter Island is on the route if you're trying to if you're really trying to sail it rather than than motor it and, and well okay trying to sail it without beating to windward forever yeah. uh <clears throat> easter island's on the route so it's a great excuse to stop in easter island and easter island is a very interesting place as, as as you mentioned uh, the the reason to go there was primarily that it was the winds were favorable to take a route that went through easter island rather than down the coast of south america Right. And what about anchorages and things? I mean, I, I don't imagine there's a fancy marina at uh, at Easter Island. Was there? Is there a sheltered place? Because I just don't hear very often of people popping in there. No, there's no sheltered anchorage. There's a small um, harbour for boats less than 15 metres. Uh, it's, it's quite small, and I, I think you need local knowledge to get in because you've got to go know where the rocks are what you really have to do is is you anchor out of the waves and wind and be prepared to move when those change and so there are several anchorages around easter island there's no harbors really they mm. there's just anchorages that'll get you away from the swell and the wind and the interesting thing about the the, the waves in easter island is is that they usually at least when i was there they they never seemed to come from the same direction as the wind because the waves were always generated by some far off storm. Right. And it, it, it bore no resemblance to the wind, which is kind of interesting. You really just had to keep, keep moving the boat to different anchorages. Yeah. Yeah. I imagined it. I just have sort of, after watching like videos of Easter Island, it just looks like it's pretty ferocious and, and exposed coastlines everywhere. But so you sailed across yeah. to, to Chile and did you say that you actually wintered somewhere in Chile? Like, did you literally, you didn't leave the boat, you stayed with it and spent a winter down there? Yeah, I anchored, uh, I spent the winter at anchor mostly in Castro, which is on a big island called Chiloé. And uh, that's that's mostly where I spent the, the winter. I would travel inland off and on during that time, but mostly I right. was doing maintenance on the boat um, and occasionally sailing. Right, so it was just as well. You did have to learn uh, Spanish uh, on the other side when you were, were doing the boat fit. It would have come in quite handy by the time you got back into Chile. So your Spanish must be quite good by now. No, I, I, I'd like to say my Spanish is quite good. I, I have to say that my Spanish is so, still, it's, it's enough to get me by. <laughs> right, right. That's all. I'm, <laughs> I'm, you don't learn it that fast when you're on a boat because you're kind of isolated. You would learn it faster if you're... If you're inland, if, In, yeah. if, totally surrounded by, by, you cannot speak anything but Spanish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then in, on your boat, you're kind of on your own little island. So you don't, ha you're not so much forced to always speak Spanish. Right. And can I ask you more about Antarctica, which is what we started with at the beginning of the conversation? Because you said you were in Patagonia. You sort of dealt with all the bureaucracy of, of sort of the, the two different countries. Doesn't the border run down the middle of one of the canals when you're sailing through Patagonia? Yes, the border between Chile and Argentina does run down the, like, like the Beagle Canal, yes. Um, so, the, so, sorry, my question was going to be then, because going into Antarctica, there's a bit of bureaucracy to get through as well. Did You, you would have had to get a permit and permission to sail down there? Uh, that's correct. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of bureaucracy to get to Antarctica legally. Um, but once you're there, there there's, it, it's, it's a, a lot of writing to get the permit. Um, but once you're there, you, are, you, you don't have to report in all the time. I, in, I, in, in Chile, you have to report in every day. Wow. Um, but yeah, both, both of those places uh, <laughs> have, have uh, extensive paper requirements. You wouldn't expect, uh, especially Antarctica, you wouldn't expect that because kind of just so isolated. But uh, almost, but 160 countries have signed the Antarctic Treaty. 
Yeah. And it, it, there are significant fines for if you're a citizen of one of those countries, like which most people in the world are, if you don't abide by the terms of them, which it requires getting a permit. And the permits are not really designed for yachts. The permits are designed for big scientific expeditions and um, things like that. And so how long did you get to spend actually, you know, on Antarctica or off the sh- offshore of Antarctica? I don't know how you'd describe it. Uh, did, did, were you there for very long or was that restricted by the permit or the weather? It, it, it wasn't restricted. It was not restricted by the permit because um, you, you can ask for whatever time you need. But uh, I, we only spent the month of, pretty much spent the month of January in Antarctica and then I was, I didn't feel I had the whole, I could have stayed longer, but I wanted to get back to North America before yeah. hurricane season. So um, that was why I only spent a month in Antarctica. And then we went to South Georgia and then South Africa. South Georgia is absolutely stunning and awesome. It's, 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 it's got its own procedures to go through it through to get there uh and they they do charge you how did the how did you go for crew sort of from the for the patagonia antarctica like you're saying south georgia and uh, across to south africa i mean some people pay thousands and thousands of dollars to get on a on a cruise ship and and go down to antarctica it's such a such an amazing experience like you say it's fairly restricted and and that sort of makes it expensive for, for people to, to holiday there. Um, I think your crew were very lucky. And, and how did you find them? I, I mostly find my crew through findacrew.net because uh, they've, they've got most, most crews seem to be on find a crew. Um, so mostly I find my crew that way. Sailing with people you don't know is, is quite a challenge. Um, it's hard for people who are with the best of intentions who try to describe themselves to others. Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard for one person's description of themselves, you know, the, it's, it, and, and, and what their goals are and, and how they are. It, it's hard for that to, to translate to someone else and, and vice versa. So that, that makes finding crew challenging. Uh, it's, it, it, it's the, the shorter the trip, the easier it is. And you can meet some great people through having them as crew. Um, but you potentially but took, it's, it's, you, you potentially took people down to Antarctica that did they have like limited knowledge of of how how the weather was going to be and and how potentially seasick they were going to get. I mean, it can be fairly strenuous. Um, Having having long stretches of, of bad weather, it's, it's physically exhausting, which then leads to it being mentally exhausting. Um, is that I mean, how do you, how do you even um, judge somebody's character unless you can put them into a stress test and and see how they hold up? You can't reliably judge someone's character <laughs> unless you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to, you know, the you, you have to take what you can. Um, I, I try to describe thing uh, how I perceive. I, I try and describe it as 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 bad as it can get, because I don't. I, I want people to understand that it can get very bad. Um, but you know, it's it's one thing to describe something in in in, in words to write it in an email, and, and mm. it's another thing to experience it. Uh, I I look is the the amount of it's knowledge people have. I mean. It varies, and the amount of experience they have varies. Uh, so do some people really understand how rough the weather will be and how much they'll get seasick before coming? No. I would no. say that they, not everyone does understand that, uh, though you try hard to make everyone understand that as much as, as you can. But it, it's, it's just not quite possible to do that. So you, you try as best you can. Mm. To describe, I, I, I try and describe as as difficult as it'll be. I, I try and describe it as as difficult as I think it it could be. Yeah, I think you'd be looking I, for I, people. I want to that dissuade were, people who are not serious. Yeah, I guess you'd be looking for people who've got a fairly adventurous nature. Like they, they don't want to go on it just just to go and see the penguins. They do understand that 
going on on something like that is really an expedition in itself, isn't it? It's got the, the qualities of an expedition where it's it's hard work, um, and you've got you've got to sort of pay the price of, of a bit of discomfort if you want to um, reap the rewards of seeing things that uh, you, pe- normal people just don't don't see every day. I guess that's right. Yeah, it's it's hard work, and it's it, it can be more than a bit of discomfort. <laughs> and, and you have to have, you know, suitable clothes and all that. You know, it's, it's darn cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it it can be very, very uncomfortable. Um, Tell me about yeah. the trip across. You went South Georgia. You have then cut across to South Africa. Did you get to spend time there? Or like you said before, you were sort of getting a bit pressed for time because you wanted to get back, uh, back, back to the east coast of the U.S. and, and safely home? I was pressed for time. Um, everything seemed to have taken longer than planned. In in South Africa, I spent three weeks just, just fixing stuff on the boat. And then to get north uh, before hurricane season, yeah, there wasn't much time. So I found myself pressed for time. And I did not, did not see much of South Africa. I, I would have liked to. It's... Uh, I would really like to go inland in South Africa and yeah. and, and see more of it. Um, went to Namibia, had two ports in Namibia, and and got a chance to go on a safari in Namibia, which was absolutely uh, fantastic. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, I I'd love to go back inland in Africa and and spend some time uh, seeing the the inland parts of the southern part of Africa, uh, but that'll have to wait for another time. Yeah, I'm looking at that map where you've, you've cut across from from Namibia all the way to the east coast. It looks like one continuous leg, but I guess I can't see the name of the islands in, in the Saint middle. Helena. You stopped at Saint Helena, right? And but after that, what? How long was that leg? How long did that take you? And, and did you say you did that leg solo at the end of this last trip? So how yeah, long? I how that long was solo. that? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, how long was that leg? That was uh, that was close to two months. It was wow. uh, like fifty something days. Um, the the reason it was it was so long was as I I, I got towards North America towards the U.S. I, I was going close to the Bermuda High, and so the winds got really light. Right. And I I have a wind vane that, that mostly steers the boat steers the boat most of the time. And then when the winds are light, I use sheets of tiller. When the winds are too light for the wind bin, I use sheets of tiller. Uh, but when they get really that light, you know, you're talking about five knots or so, they're, they're often variable and they sometimes change quickly. And I don't always, sometimes the sheets of tiller isn't enough. And, and then it, I don't have an autopilot. So at that point, I can either hand steer or I could motor and hand steer. But if you're single handing, you can't hand steer all that long. Yeah. Uh, so I would always strive to sail instead of motor. Uh, but when the winds are really light, you just don't go very far. So it it, it made for uh, a slow trip. At in the last the last third of it was fairly slow. And was that frustrating for you, or were you by then fairly relaxed? Like you said, that you you sort of did find that you enjoyed the solo sailing, or or were you sitting on the boat, sort of. Uh, Dancing a jig and pulling your hair out, waiting for the wind to pick up. Oh no, I was I was fine with it. I I was just paying attention to the, all the hurricane forecasts, and uh, I was enjoying the time. Uh, and yeah. I was really just enjoying it. I I knew that I had to get into port. I wanted to get in to port soon, but you know that that the wind wasn't going to make it happen soon. Well, that was not really a. Mm. That was just the way it was. That wasn't a major concern. It was it was a uh, enjoyable Excellent. passage. It was hard work with a lot of sail changes and all that and, and the light winds, but uh, it was enjoyable. Right, and so the, you sailed the boat back up to New York because New York's home. That's where you are now, and, I, and that's where I'm talking. I know you're there now because we had to work out the the time zones. But New York's home. Uh, home is where the boat is. Uh, I did live in New York for a long time, but uh, I'm just visiting here right now. I, I may come. I may come back here. I'm not quite sure. Uh, it depends where I find a job. Okay. So the so, boat's the boat's there with you. What's the What's the plan? Are you 
debating between boat and another trip? Uh, I need to work for a few years and, and save some money up. And then my next trip, I, I would like to go back to Labrador and Greenland. I mean, they're both stunningly, pla- stunningly beautiful places. And uh, neither of them is all that far. If you're, if you're on the east coast of North America, neither of them is all that far. It's not like going mm-hmm. to South Africa. To, sorry, going to Antarctica. So, yeah, that's, that's my, my plan, and, uh, to spend a summer going to Labrador and Greenland. Oh, that's awesome. Richard, I, like I said at the start, I mean, it's just looking at the map because, I mean, obviously sailors are, a, I mean, we're our own, our own little niche audience of, of enthusiasm for sailing and, and we sort of respect and, and can appreciate someone like yourself doing such an amazing uh, uh, journey on your boat. How do you find it? You, you, you said to me when we were corresponding a little bit, you know, you're going out to dinner with some friends and, uh, and so we were sort of planning our times around that. But how do you find it is, do you find it, I mean, people who don't understand sailing probably wouldn't understand sort of the, the enormous journey that you've made. Do you, do you ever sort of, I don't know, do, does that sort of ever strike you? I mean, when people say, oh, what have you been up to the last couple of years? Do you, do you find yourself sort of hesitating to, to start talking about the enormity of the journey? Do you sort of find yourself downplaying it? Or I don't know, what I'm trying to ask is, you know, do, do you find it funny that maybe some people don't realise what an, an enormous uh, trip you've had? Oh, I, I, I just uh, say I've been sailing and judge how much detail I go into based on how much interest and knowledge they seem to have. I mean, people who haven't gone long distance sailing don't understand how much work it is to, to run a boat, to, uh, to keep a boat in, in, in good maintenance and just, just to operate the boat, mm-hmm. you know, looking out, planning on the weather and all, all that stuff you know, that, you know, you're aware of. Most people don't think of that. They think, you know, you just, uh, it's a, it's a relaxing way of life and you, you just set the sails. They take you where you want to go and do you enjoy the sun, the sun, the sun and then the sip of cold beer and, and, and yeah. enjoy yourself all the yeah. time. Yeah, that, that's right. Well, I think it's amazing, Richard. Thanks for just running us through basically. I mean, it, it's such a, such enormous trip we've covered in a relatively short time. There's some really good detail on your, um, website. I mentioned it before, isuma.com. I mean, it's obviously, I don't think it's like your number one priority in life, sort of entertaining people uh, on the internet, but you have collected some, some beautiful photos. Um, I'll put links to your website with the sailing podcast sort of show notes that I do so people can go and have a look. Some of the stuff that's there, um, I've, I've seen there's like really good descriptions of of your boat and pictures from the previous owner of it out of the water so people can see the shape of the hull and and maybe you know how how it's been designed to be to be able to handle the high latitude you've got links to i saw some of the other boats that you've had um you've got articles yep. there about sailing a, a schooner and, and some of your thoughts about how about how they handle and that might be really interesting to people who haven't spent a lot of time on them like i i've never um sailed on one so i thought it was really interesting to hear about the to read about the sail handling and things um yeah i think it's a great resource richard thanks for thanks for putting it out there and and i'd I'd love to share it with people oh thank you david thank thanks for your time it's been great thanks very much david it's been great talking to you thanks richard talk to you later all right, thank you. Bye. Well, thanks again, Richard. It was great to hear about your travels. Uh, I hope we can catch up again after your trip to Greenland. Uh, I'm sure that would be an amazing uh, experience as well. Don't forget to download the Sailing Podcast app. Use iTunes or go into the Google Play Store if you've got an Android phone. Uh, just search using the words The Sailing Podcast. I'll try and find some more extras to publish uh, to the app uh, as we catch up with future guests. Uh, Speaking of future guests, there's a couple of Aussies just about to pop into Noosa on the Sunshine Coast. It's Michael and Andy Holt. Uh, They've just returned from a season cruising the South Pacific in their yacht, Rome. Uh, And if you want to check out their YouTube channel, it's Sail Surf Rome. 
uh, hopefully I can catch up with them and we can hear about uh, the building of their yacht in Tasmania and some tales from sailing in the South Pacific this season. Well, thanks again for listening. I hope you have a great day and thank you for joining us on our journey. You've been listening to David and Karina Anderson of The Sailing Podcast. Boo, boo, boo.